Good evening, everybody. I'd like to especially thank Professor Devang Kakar, the director of the institute, uh, the distinguished faculty from various departments, students, and some alumni from my batch who have come here today. I thank everybody and some ex faculty members also. So, this is fantastic for me. Uh, I feel really honored. Uh, I'm sorry that some people have to stand. Let's hope I can make it interesting enough and worthwhile enough for you to have stood. Just a few minutes ago, Professor Momaya said that it's very difficult to force, forecast the future. In fact, many people have forecast the future and got completely wrong. So I'm not going to indulge in that speculative exercise at all. Instead, what I'll do is I'll try and explain to you how you can actually get a glimpse of the future by looking at technologies which are already developed. And the whole idea is to look at these technologies and see how it will impact specific fields and then look at what the impact on those specific fields will be on other fields. When you go two or three levels downstream, what comes out is total surprise. And these things will happen. So it will, it's important for all of you whether you are trying to make a career outside academia or in academia or whether you want to do research to because you might change the direction in which you might move if only you knew for certain that certain things are going to develop in a certain way in the future. So I hope you learn how to kind of figure out what the future is going to look like at the end of this lecture. So I am not going to do anything profound. I am going to pick up things which are happening and tell you what. My interest in this kind of um, subject started one summer day, night in when I was in Aberdeen in 2007 and I put switched on the TV and I saw the news that one of the largest Scottish banks called Northern Rock had sunk like a rock that, that day. So that made me wonder why is this happening and is it possible that it was possible to predict and that could have saved the lives and livelihoods of so many hapless investors. So when I looked into it, I realized that this whole thing happened on account of a huge amount of speculative investments, it's been investment products created by American bankers, a product called CDS, which most people hadn't heard of at that time. I said, look, I wish it was possible to look back from May 2007 and say, the root cause could have been seen earlier. And as I looked into it more and more, I realized that this whole CDS was created as multi-layer products, pseudo products, pseudo investment products on a base of very shaky loans advanced to people whose likelihood of repaying is very low. And when I studied the algorithms used for this, there were two critical assumptions that interest rates won't go up and property prices will not come down. And by 2006, it had actually gone the opposite way. So there was no way the algorithms would work. And therefore, all those who bought these products after that were asking for trouble. Unfortunately, it was couched in such brilliant uh, packaging that people just bought, thinking these are great safe products on which you get great returns. Then I said, look, what? why not look at what will happen from that day onwards? And I said, oh my God, the whole global economy is going to collapse within a year. So between October 2007 and March 2008, I had the opportunity to speak at various fora about the likely collapse. And by March 2008, it was, the fault lines were very clear. And it was evident that this was going to happen and in July it happened. And there was no magic in this. It was just trying to do a logical, deductive projection of what will happen because of what has happened. The same thing can be applied across sectors and from then onwards I have been, uh, this is a, a subject which is a passion, whether social trends or political trends or economics, I have been writing on it because it is possible to look at some of these events and take, connect the dot to the next dot and the third dot and the fourth dot is like something very surprising. So, last year I was asked to talk to the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Mumbai to a senior businessman and I made a few predictions which they said, look, this is not possible. 
like first was many of the auto component manufacturers and also the automobile lubricant manufacturers, their business will be in trouble in less than 10 years time and it will decline, decline after that. Now it seemed absolutely crazy and I don't blame them for saying that I was making a crazy prediction because the, the prediction was that India's auto component exports would rise sevenfold from 11.2 billion to 80 billion by 2026 and these are not some crazy people writing these predictions, they are respectable things. Similarly, no new petrol or diesel engine cars will be produced, even hybrids, in another 14 years from now. Now, it's strange because the fleet news, which is a very respectable uh, paper you read on automobile industry, they were saying that real debate is whether in 2030, what percentage of the cars will be hybrid? Okay, so it's not about not being produced. Many people in the room would not bother to own cars in 10 years, which most of you know now. Okay, um, but the International Energy Agency, which understands what's happening in petroleum, etc., had predicted that car ownership in India will go up 775 percent by 2040. And here I'm saying, you may not want to own a car. Cars will be there, but you may not want to own a car. Oil price I said will drop to 12 to 15 dollars per barrel in seven years' time when World Bank is predicting that it will go up to 80 dollars. Okay. Similarly, the demand for transmission towers and transmission equipment, conductors, etc., are going to see a steep fall in a few years' time. Although the government of India is saying we're going to invest double our investment in this. Okay. So I said also that there will be no new power plants conventional power plants set up in the next five years. Now that is already being is visible. But I am saying that it looks crazy to make these predictions, but it is not difficult to make these predictions. And it is very unlikely that you will go wrong if you connect the dots. That is what I meant by this. So why is it so, not so obvious? It is because we are mentally trained to look for cause and effect and not to look at cause and effect and effect on that and this and then multiple things. That is the way we are trained mentally. If only we can just say, look, let us not assume that if th there is a cause and there is an effect, that will not have its own ripple effect. The moment you look at two or three ripples, things become pretty clear to you. Okay. So, let me start with this big spat which is going on last week, where uh, both of them are calling each other people who do not understand artificial intelligence. They both invested heavily in artificial intelligence, but they are saying, look, uh, Elon Musk says that AI will go to such a dangerous extent that it will wipe out jobs and livelihoods across the world, across sectors, and there is even a danger of robots doing harm to India, uh, to human beings. And Mark Zuckerberg says that, look, that is crazy, the guy does not understand AI. There is going to be a huge number of new jobs created. So, what is the truth? I tend to believe that, yes, they will leave jobs destroyed. But Zuckerberg has some very valid point. For instance, when the first cars were brought out, many people bemoaned the loss of jobs for carpenters and for horse car drivers. But fortunately, in a short span of 15 years, a lot more of cars were produced, the roadways expanded significantly, so at least 500 times more jobs were created as a result of the cars coming in. Okay, So, computers, many of you in this room were too young to know that at, there was a time when people said, oh computers, they are going to destroy jobs, it is not a good thing. In fact, the government of Kerala, in fact, officially said no use of computers in any government offices. We will not allow them and they encouraged the party ranks to see that even private sector does not use computers. But today, the same government is doing everything possible to give incentives to set up IT companies because they have seen fantastic amount of exports of IT products, animation, services and so on and so forth. So sometimes when new things happen, we do not accept them. They think the immediate consequence will be loss of jobs, but they do not see that it will create something else. So, big changes are happening and I am going to talk about them, but most of us do not realize because 
when the change is slow, we don't even feel the change, we just absorb the change and don't realize something is happening. So I'm going to pick up three point topics to start with before I get on to something more exciting. And what can be more exciting than the three industries that's batteries, sensors and solar cells. No other industries have grown as fast in the history of industry. Amazing rate of growth. In fact, when the rate of growth of any industry is like uh, about 20%, you've got to ask yourself, there's something is happening. It's not, don't take it in a stride. You say, look, what is happening? What's going to change the result of this? And these things are going at a scorching pace and I'll just spend a few minutes on it. So, you know that the car, conventional electric car, the EVs, about 30 to 35 percent of cost is the battery itself, which is why Riva is struggling to expand. It should have expanded. That's because the right type of battery wasn't available. Now the battery prices have dropped significantly. If you look at, I've got data from the Bloomberg uh, Energy, New Energy Finance. The cost per kilowatt hour has dropped in the last uh, seven years from $1,000 per kilowatt hour to something like $200 per kilowatt hour. You know how much? Five times in hardly five, six years. We talk, we get impressed when something drops at 20% or 15%, but this is that colossal drop. We don't realize it because we're not worried about the economics of it. We're busy with our own industry, our own profession. And it's expected that another, by 2020, it's likely to be in the region of $80. Now, this has huge implications. When it reaches 100, it does not make sense to make a petrol engine or diesel engine car at all. The economics have swung completely to battery. Now, you can see that there are some estimates made by, by Bloomberg about how fast the demand for electric vehicle cars will go up. This is electric vehicle battery power demand. But that's a very conservative estimate according to me. They have not taken into account the demand for storage of non-conventional energy. You must have read last month that Tesla has signed an agreement with the, with South Australia, the state of South Australia to build the largest single storage battery to take care of and they've said we'll deliver in 100 days and if we don't deliver it's free the south australian government just couldn't refuse that offer because they're hoping they're, st they're still hoping they'll get it free because it'll <laughs> come on the 101st day okay but that's the kind of thing happening you know so the demand for storage batteries is going to go up like crazy now there's a lot of there are a lot of people who feel that lithium ion has almost reached its uh, level of uh, technical level of uh, cost reduction and further cost reduction will be tough but there are a lot of others who believe that this 40 percent CAGR cost reduction per year is going to happen. Just when that debate was going on, uh, Dr. Professor Good Enough, who doesn't think anything is good enough, huh? he says, look, he was a co-founder of lithium-ion batteries in 1982. He's now come working with a team to create a solid electrolyte a glass electrolyte with sodium ion and not lithium ion. Now the implication is, are there two big implications. One is that um, sodium is cheap compared to lithium, it's available all over the world. It's going to impact China, it's going to impact South America because that's where it's mined. So it's going to, some people are going to lose jobs. But the good news is that there's one great thing that this solid electrolyte with glass electrolyte between sodium and the sodium ions pass through it, is that it can allow very rapid charging. You know, the lithium ion battery is a liquid electrolyte. In the liquid electrolyte, if you, the rate of charging goes up beyond a certain point, dendrites form, metal dendrites form, which connect the positive to the negative. The electro electrodes are connected and there's a short circuit, explodes. Probably in an attempt to improve the speed at which the Samsung 7 bat phone's battery was uh, in that attempt, in a liquid electrolyte, they created this, the dendrite must have formed and that's how they started exploring. That's the only reason why they are not trying to make faster and faster batteries with lithium ion. But with glass batteries, with sodium, that problem is solved. Now, my question to you is, can we at IIT not start some research in that area? You don't, you're not 
we are not a country which doesn't have, we don't have lithium, but we have sodium. We can figure out ways to do it. So, it's a very challenging, interesting space to be in. Now, the rise of electric cars, I said, battery technology has improved so fast because of the volume of batteries being produced and the technology improving. So, now cars are going to switch from IC engines to battery engines. Now, what happens? As a result of which, it will stop making the engines of this kind. So, what, what does that dot connect to? Now, there are people who believe and Bloomberg believes by 2040, that is what the graph says, about a certain percentage of cars, which according to him is 35 percent of all the new cars produced in 2040 will be EVs, electric vehicles. My own research says it will be 100 percent by 2030. Because by 2020, the cost of the battery is going to come down to 80 dollars, even if sodium ion batteries are not introduced. And if it is 80 dollars, then why certain amount, the, the rate at which the share of EVs will increase will be quite significant. And so, the path to 100 percent will be very clear. Today, the path to 100 percent is not clear. The second thing that is required is that a, bat a car should work on one charge for the whole day, which means in America, they say it should run 320 kilometers per day. The first car to run 300 kilometers, 320 kilometers a day was released last Friday, the Tesla 3. Okay, it is not in mass production because uh, at $35,000, which is the same as the average price of a car, anyone can switch. They have a backlog of production for the more costly $49,000 car. So, the release officially has happened, but the actual mass production will be from January 2018. But you are already there, where the car, uh, ordinary Buick would cost the same. Why would you not go have a Tesla 3? Now, the Tesla 3 has all the features of a luxury car. Now, I am stupid to own an Audi A6, if I could get a, this thing. And Audi A6 costs an arm and a leg. So, why would I ever not get rid of it? I would. So, it is not just eating the common car, but it is eating, eating the high-end cars on all performance parameters. And the price of $35,000, it is wrecking the conventional engine cars. And what happens to the oil demand? That is the next thing. Okay. Because of this battery, diesel engine and petrol engine cars will produce. Because of that, the demand for oil comes down. So, the oil crash, there is going to be an oil crash by 2020, when the demand for oil will drop by about somewhere between 1.5 to 2 million barrels per day. So, today the demand is something like 88 billion barrels a day. If it drops by 1.5 to 2, the immediate impact on oil demand or de price is that it will come down to something like 25 dollars. Today we are at 40, 45 dollars. And then the oil disaster is just a further few years away. As I said, by 2030, when 100 percent of the cars are produced by this, the line of sight is very clear from 2020 to where it is 10 or 15 percent of the cars will be EV to 100 percent. And if the oil producing countries keep fighting with each other to make sure that their market share is in place, which is what is happening all you know, then the price of oil will come down to 12 to 15 dollars. Okay. So, that is why I am saying 15 dollars and not 80 dollars like World Bank is saying. And you are seeing it is happening. Okay. So, the crash will be 2020, oil disaster is, 20, is the same. Now, even that has got implication, but I am not getting into that because it can, it's like a pancharatna, panchatantra, it can go on. Okay. But let us say, do you think uh, these batteries, they will have be charged? So, they will still need some electricity and one of the biggest consumers of, uh, of, power, of energy is, is the power plants. But the point is that photo, solar photovoltaic cells, just like that has increased, reduced in price, there has been an 80 percent drop in the cost, in the pricing of a solar cell between 2011 and 2016, the last five, five years, 80 percent drop. That is now 2 dollars per watt. Right now, they expected to be 1 dollar per watt by 2020. And that price, why would anyone want to use 
fossil fuel to produce electricity. It will be solar. And very soon you will, for charging this, you will have solar powered charging stations. I saw two or three when I was in the US in the month of May. They will be widespread. They don't need a lot of space. Even this space, as long as there is place to park three cars, there could be three charging stations, less than a petrol pump and there is a solar cell and that is it. Now, if, if for instance, they are going to use sodium battery, the charging can happen in few minutes and not eight hours. So, it is amazing, you just go there, plug it in and you, off you go. In Amsterdam, for instance, last month, they introduced a new bus service where at every bus stop, when the bus stops for three seconds, one device comes down and tops up the battery, it does not charge the full battery, just tops it up in three seconds and the bus moves on, the next bus stop again in three seconds, it gets topped up. So, the, it runs for the whole day. So, there are various things that are happening and you do not need to have one charge for the whole day. I said the next thing is sodium. One of my favorite authors was Jules Verne. In 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, he talks of a submarine and he is actually, if you have read it, there is a design also of the submarine in 1867. Okay? And he says that is charged run by with sodium batteries okay and why he says the emf of of sodium is very high that's the right metal to use so hundreds of years later now we are actually doing it okay now you will soon have cars with bat solar batteries on the roof of the car and on the bonnet just continuously charging in a country like ours and the cost per what if it's 1 1 dollar in great shape and in France, in one village, they have actually put solar cells on the tarmac, tar road. Enough power is generated during the day to power the village. So, this is the kind of stuff happening. So, where do we need power plants? So, there are lots of consequences. There will be, as a result of this, there will be less oil required to be transported. You know, 70% of the, all the oil produces is exported to another country because there are only few places where oil is produced. So, oil tanker business is a big business. Now, why would you buy the share of a company which is in the oil tanker business, where it is going to sink in a few years? There is not much oil to carry. The chemical tankers for other chemicals, there is not a large demand compared to oil demand. So, all these huge oil tankers are going to have a big problem. Immigration, unless the Middle East turns into a global hub for petro downstream petrochemicals, which is very likely to happen. We will not have this kind of immigration. I think here we've got a professor who is very wise. He's come back <laughs> beforehand. <laughs> he was no man. He's only here on a holiday, right? Is it? Come he's come back. See, <laughs> he's read the reading on the wall, <laughs> writing on the wall. Okay. So, <laughs> so exports of labor to the Middle East is going to come down. You know what happens to banks? You know, a large number of our public sector banks depend a profitability is coming on the low cost deposits from the Gulf. That's gone. That will go. But banks have more problems. We'll come to that later. <laughs> this is the least of their problems. Okay. So if talk to you about batteries, talk to you about solar cells, how the costs have gone down. The most amazing thing is on sensors. Now, sensors, now if you, and you also, I am not going to waste time in this audience to talk about artificial intelligence, you know, a lot of developments happen. If you combine the two, it is possible to do everything that our five senses can do. Smell, hear, touch, see, taste, there are sensors. It is not like fantasy, there are sensors already to help you to do this. So, if somebody is able to combine this, it is possible to make everything smart. From phones. We already have smartphones to smart toothbrushes, which will start doing extra work in cavities, to cars, autonomous cars. Even Johnny Walker started shipping whiskey bottles with a sensor on it, so they can figure out that there is no no pill fridge. Okay. Now, why is all this happening? There is a reason, and these are the staggering statistics. The number of sensors. In the last, in seven years, from 2007 to 2014, and this is a, the source is Tony Seba, it's gone up 1000 times in seven years. 
just try and calculate the CAGR, the, the compound annual rate of growth. It's gone up from 10 million to 10 billion is the demand in 2014. The cost has come down 1000 times. I mean, he is an industrialist. If he can reduce his cost by 15%, he'll, he'll give a, throw a party to his whole company. Okay? Yeah, but with what you are saying, most likely I'll, I'll have to close down my company. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, there's lots of good news. No, but so it's gone down. The cost has come down from $250 per axis in gyros to 75 cents on three axes. That is 25 cents. That's a thousand times. The power consumption has gone down a thousand times. It's not measured in watts anymore. It's measured in microwatts. The physical size has come down a thousand times. The number of transistors on each has come gone up a thousand times. Okay. Think of any industry which has had such phenomenal change, progress unlimited. So if this is happening, there is an ocean churning underneath of applications and change. So we, as I said a little while ago, even if you see an industry going at 30 percent per annum for a number of years, you got to say something is going to change. Here it's all thousand times. So there's a huge, it's so cheap and so powerful that any way you can use it, you can use it free almost. So imagine the kind of applications they're going to be. So Google, Apple, Tesla, and even Nissan are testing driverless cars using a lot of sophisticated LiDAR and types of sensors. Budweiser beer was transported across California in a large truck. You've seen those huge American trucks? No driver. In November, they did that experiment. No crash. Uh, I used a driverless taxi a few months ago in Singapore. It's a bit eerie, but then uh, it worked. Uh, You're here. Yeah, I'm here. That's a proof. So, there are many downstream, many other companies like GM, Ford, etc. are joining this game with Tesla, Apple and Google. They are saying, look, these companies are not even our industry. They are coming and changing the industry. We better change ourselves before we get wiped out. Forget about what's going to happen to drivers, that profession. Just like the horse car driver, we have a problem coming up in a few years for poor drivers. Why would you own a car if Ola and Uber are so cheap? And you can use it for, like if you want to go for a very important wedding, you can hire a Mercedes. If you want to go to Pune, you can hire an Uber uh, SUV. If you just want to go and buy fish in the market, you will buy a Uber Go. You can choose whatever car you want. Why would you want to have one car or two cars and have to park, drive, all that headache. So I couldn't see why any one of us should have cars in 10 years time. Own cars, we will use. So driverless cars will take a little more time in India because we are so chaotic. But, but the point is that this industry is changing and G General Motors is now thinking of figuring out that in the future we will not be able to sell cars, they are going to offer cars as a service. That is why they bought Lyft which is a competitor of Uber. So just imagine they are not going to sell cars or they may not sell cars. Okay. Now, Spare a thought for the guys who are downstream of automobiles. The auto component industry is about 700 billion dollar. If there is no engine, why do you need engine parts? If there is no cylinder head, why would you have a foundry making cylinder heads? There are many large foundries which will have a problem because that's one of the most pro cylinder heads and cylinder blocks are the most profitable things to make in a in a cast iron foundry, right? Okay. So, 90 percent of the components will disappear. You don't need it. What do you need in an uh, electric car? You have a motor, you have a battery and a governor. Governor will be part software, part hardware. That's what it is. The rest of the components will be required, but under the hood, nothing else. Auto repair shops will now be doing more electrical stuff, motors and things like that. Uh, they will have to change their business. Automobile lubricants except for braking fluids, there is a bit of a problem coming up. That is what I said in the beginning that it is going to change. So Castrol has to think seriously what to do. The shares are doing very well right now, but uh, other than braking fluids there is a bit of a problem. Okay. Um, but good news for them is that 
the raw material they use for making lubricants become very much cheaper because the Middle East will have to focus on that. So, I think this is a great opportunity if petrochemicals are going to become so cheap and downstream have been cheap, then chemical engineers, material science engineers can do a whole lot of things which were considered financially unviable applications. You can think of so many things which you can work on. Now, the solar and lithium ion batteries are a big problem for the power plants, big problem. And also the downstream, for instance, today we have got about 3 lakh megawatts of power capacity in India. Some are lying idle because the coal linkages are not there. Some more projects are under implementation where they are wondering what to do, whether to implement or not. Uh, the big threat is that most power utilities de depend on demand charges. You know, when you uh, look at the electricity bill, there is some fixed charge irrespective of whether you use electricity or not. That is dependent on the connected load, it is called demand charge. There is also another component, the energy charge, which is how many units are consumed. So, if you consume zero en units, also you have a certain bill. Now, the demand charge part is really the one which helps them to remain profitable. You take the demand charge off and the uh, Tata Power or anybody will be unviable. So, what would anyone do in this? Instead of having a peak requirement of high, when a, suppose your requirement is uh, x at some times of the day and it comes down to uh, x minus delta in the afternoon, then you will ask for a connected load of x minus delta and for the rest you will use a battery. So, the demand charge will now come down, that is bad news for power utilities. Okay. Uh, the bigger threat is that solar power at 2 rupees a, a kilowatt is very close by, it is already 3 rupees. Just yet, day before yesterday, the minister said uh, the new normal is 3 rupees per kilowatt hour. No, the new normal is not yet 3, it is going to come down. As I said, the cost of batteries, etc., are coming down. So, solar and solar cells are coming down. So, it is going to be 2 rupees. If it is 2 rupees, why would you pay 6 and 8 rupees and 10 rupees per power? As long as you are not again pointing to you, if it is an electric arc furnace, there will be a huge surge in the beginning. That cannot be handled. So, we will have to figure out a way to, but otherwise, um, it is bad news. The biggest threat, and just think about this, the, it is projected that the cost of producing power in the solar cell, when it comes down to 65 dollars instead of 80 dollars per megawatt, will be less than the cost of transmitting power from a power plant to your house. So, if you produce power at zero and transmit it to your house, it will be costlier than making power at your house. So, what is going to happen? That is a huge problem. So, a lot of microgrids are being created with uh, this thing across the world, there is a lot of work being going on, on microgrids and a lot of work going on in software development to match microgrids with the normal grid. It is an area where we at IIT should be doing a lot of work because that is the future. So, inefficient power plants will be mothballed, no new energy, conventional energy plants will come up after a certain date. And if no new plants are coming up and you do not need to transmit over such long distances, even if the share of microgrids is 30 percent, the demand for transmission will come down. I am not saying transmission will go, it will have to be there, but it will come down. Now, the good news is that when you have so much solar produ uh, power production, greenhouse and emission will come down. So, we'll, we have a hope to breathe fresher air in the future because the biggest pollutant is power in the world, which is why they say please use as few uh, bulbs as possible, do not keep it on all day. But there is also some one industry who has got to face bad news. There is a huge industry which does pollution control devices and consumables, bag filters and so on and so forth. What is going to happen to them? So, you can predict that that industry has a big problem coming up all starting with some development in solar cells. So, it just connect dots and you can say for certain that these guys are going to be trouble. Maybe you cannot say whether it is 5 years or 8 years or 10 years. Okay. Now, material science, I was in the, that department. So, I have to have some section on that. So, it will not be complete otherwise. <laughs> so, how do we 
start using materials. It was painstakingly developed over the years. You extracted from ores, found out what the properties are, what's the crystallographic structure, is this BCC, FCC, or whatever it is, and say these are properties, and then say, okay, here's an application. Let me, I can use steel of this kind, or I can do heat treatment, and then it'll be good, or whatever it is. But then suddenly, somebody called John Pope, about 40, 50 years ago, he said, look, why can't I use this? principles of quantum mechanics to developing materials and he did a lot of useful work. Then somewhere in 1998 or 2000, there is a professor Gerbrandt Cedar. He said, look, the human genome has been mapped and there is a process and there are lots of things can be done with it. Why can't I use the same principles for developing materials? And he did a huge amount of work on that. Then there's a very interesting person named Nicola Marzari in Lausanne. He's got his lab there. And Stefano Cotalo at Duke University. They started harnessing advances in artificial intelligence, the massive computing power that we have, which is not expensive, and combining it with material science. And because of that, we have something called computational material science, which is the rage now. Several countries are investing a lot of money in R and D on computational material science, so you'll soon start to be able to make applications. With you have an application in mind and say, which kind of atoms should I combine to make a new material? It is predicted that by 2026 20, there will be at least 25,000 new materials available for industry. It has taken all of mankind's time to produce that many materials. We don't have that many probably have 10,000 materials or something, including polymers. The huge jump is going to happen because of computational material science. And it's, there's, if, in the US almost every university is, has to have that. China is spending a lot of money on computational material science. If you are not doing it, we better start doing it at this institute. The reason is access to performance materials is going to be extremely important. I remember in about 15 years ago, the government of India selected my consulting company to figure out what are the strategic materials India needs and what should be done. It was a very confidential project with uh, former president Abdul Kalam in charge as a mentor for the project. It was amazing work which was possible to do. But it was determined that just as countries are going to go for war for water, you are going to fight for performance materials. Now, this is extremely strategic for the country. If our objective as IIT is to do R&D and create knowledge which will help the country, then computation material science is something you can't avoid. At least start thinking about. Okay. So, I am just saying, I'm saying that imagine the potential for students and faculty to work on this strategically important field which draws strength from computer science, material science, civil engineering, chemical, chemistry, Physics, math, all this is required to do computation material science. It's, it's, and we have all these here. So it's, it's a question of trying to figure out the next big thing where we combined capabilities to do things. Additive matter manufacturing, a lot of you already know a lot about that, shouldn't be talking about 3D printing. But you know, it is originally designed for prototyping. I remember when I was organizing the Silver Jubilee function for IIM Ahmedabad. I had invited Dr. Raj Reddy of Cornell, who is doing amazing work in robotics and others. And he came and talked about rapid prototyping. So that is what is 3D printing today and he had predicted what will happen in rapid prototyping. So it was designed to make one piece. It is so expensive to make a prototype, so he said they can find a figure out by doing printing products, you can make it cheap. So, it was never designed for mass or rapid production. So, in the last 20 years, the emphasis was never on increasing the speed of production. Emphasis on being able to produce intricate parts. Now, it is still being used in industry now in the last 3-4 years to produce niche products. That niche market itself is a 5 billion dollar market which is expected to be a 20 billion dollar market by 2020. 
it if your factory is somewhere far away and it takes days for send an engineer to get a part checked and then replaced it takes one month shut, shut down instead you can if you have a printer from wherever you are you can actually get that activated and the printers start producing that one part for you and lots of that's happening already so that's nothing great but the point is that when r and d shifts to figuring out how to make this into a mass rapid production the whole game will change and the shift is happening now to say look we've got rapid prototyping or 3d printing what is stopping us from uh, stopping it from going mainframe is the speed so there's some simple things that they are doing but the objective is to see how to take it uh, beyond changing the check wheel and other things to see how the application can be faster and it is believed that if it grows 50 fold speed then this whole game will change and uh, there is no prediction that it will happen 5 years or 6 years but a lot of work is going on. So like it is not about just improving the pinch wheel mechanism or the feed rate which is which has already happened and in the last 2-3 years it is the speed has gone two and a half times to three times. But the point is that if you want to increase the speed further, you can if you use robots with self-learning algorithms and cameras which can see a defect so that when the next layer is printed, that defect is covered, then your speed of production goes up like crazy. So all this is going to happen. But again, I'm saying for students and faculty, there's a pretty interesting area to invest their thoughts in, and probably it could be projects that could be done. Because these are things which are going to happen and if you are there, you will be noted as one of the pioneers in the field. Blockchain, I think I am talking to a technologist so everyone knows it, but really it, what does it do? It allows parties who don't know each other to trust each other because there is such a secure method of uh, ledgers, so no one can fiddle with it. So now tell me why do you go and put money in the bank? knowing that the bank goes and lends it to somebody else because the the you know that you can trust the bank the lender knows that the bank can be trust the borrower knows they can trust the bank to stick to the terms and not suddenly increase uh, interest rates threefold so the it's able to connect you and i who will put small money money in the bank to a, a lender and this this guy is uh, to a borrower and the bank is a trusted intermediary which takes care of it. But if there is blockchain, why do you need a bank? You don't need it. Technology can do it far better than there will be hardly any, there won't be too many bank managers who will fiddle around and take bribes and give your, your good money away. Okay. So it eliminates the need for a costly institution like a bank. So when I talked about it last year, uh, the general reaction was no. Then this lady who was the former head of the Royal Bank of Scotland in India, she said, why do you think I left the banking system? The, the future is very clear, this is going to happen. Okay? So the banks are going to reinvent themselves significantly. Now, HSBC and Bank of America Merrill Lynch have decided, last year they got into a project where they said they will use it for LCs, letters of credit, for the transaction. That is a two, billion, 2 trillion dollar trade and they want to be there at the forefront of that and not get uh, sort of eclipsed by fintech companies. So the banks are saying let us adopt it, let us downsize whatever it happens but we will keep our revenue and profits, we do not care if many jobs go, they are not required, not required. So this is the start of another revolution. So once the IOT starts in a significant way and a lot of things have to be connected, devices cars and all other, all kinds of things, you need some so trusted intermediary which connects and does not do funny things in between and you already have it, the technology is there, it is not, it is still niche but it is going to happen, whether it is going to take 4 years or 8 years, I do not know, but 10 years most certainly. Let us move on quickly into uh, manufacturing 4.0, you saw that over the last 30 years the needle has moved from the west to the east. All manufacturing moved to China, Vietnam, India and so on, not so much India yet, but many countries in the east got the benefit. The west has been itching to get back and the Germans made a fair amount of investment. Now it is not as if what the Germans did was not, un, what, not 
traceable. You could have imagined, you could have easily imagined what you could do if you could integrate IoT, additive manufacturing, that is 3D printing, AI sensors, fast computing, analytics, internet, imaging systems, digital technologies, um, logistic systems, etc. If you if we were to integrate them, even 10 years ago, these existed, all these individual pieces existed. So, if you had thought about it, you could have imagined a situation where these can be connected and you can create great efficiencies. That is exactly what the Germans started working on about 5-6 years ago and today they, uh, they have created what, uh, what you can call a cyber physical manufacturing system where if there is a slight demand change like for instance there is a, a huge problem on the Bombay Pune highway expressway and the next 4 days it will not be possible to move goods. Then with that signal it is possible to for the whole manufacturing plant to start producing a different specification for another client whose orders are going to produce actually next week. You will start producing it this week without human intervention. The demand signal changes, it says okay now we will change production and everything up to logistics gets taken care of. Now this is not imaginary stuff, it is already happening in Germany. Very soon we will we'll be adopting it in our factories. Even India is working, there are some institutions and companies are working on manufacturing 4.0, even IT companies are working on with company, with uh, their clients. So, but China is far ahead of the race in this case. Somehow I feel that for us to participate as IIT in this game is not just an opportunity, it is a huge responsibility. Because if we do things, there are a lot of people who believe that India's Make in India campaign will actually happen and we won't lose out to the West. So, if you think about it, you will say, look, here is an opportunity, here is a responsibility as a, uh, as a technologist and here is the opportunity, uh, uh, talent available in this campus. Shouldn't we look at it? I don't need to answer that question. Um, now, the next big thing in computing, we are all thrilled with whatever is happening, we are all talking about the problem that industry is facing because it depended on the uh, on manpower exports virtually even though it is not called manpower exports anymore. It is given sophisticated names like uh, what is it? What is the way of quoting? Uh, time and materials pricing which means I will put people, I will charge you for their time. What you can decide what they do. Now, that model is not working anymore, that is why we are having a problem. In the meanwhile, lots of other things are, ha are happening elsewhere. So, computer science and quantum physics are coming together. Um, many of you know that physical particles, we understand the, for the laws of physics, how it works. Uh, enough information everybody in this room has. But the moment you go to the nano scale, the same, all these particles start behaving in a completely bizarre manner completely bizarre and this is what was explained by Niels Bohr 95 years ago. Now they are using that knowledge in computers to change it. Another reason why they are using it, in using Moore's law if you see every 18 months if the power of the computer has to double by miniaturization also, there comes a time when it becomes so close that the space for electronic movement is so little that you are moving from physical age to the quantum size. So, there is no choice but to go there, but when you go there, it is a completely different game and uh, it has already been applied in atomic clocks, it has been MRI is based on quantum mechanics. Okay. Now, what is special about this? You know, the um, what you program is a qubit, that is a quantum binary bit, it is an electron. Now, what is the two big properties of in quantum mechanics, which is weird, is entanglement and superposition. What do you mean by superposition? Or entangle mean 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 words. One electron here, and there's another electron maybe many miles away. Something happens to this electron, it affects that other electron and start behaving. It's almost like similar twins. One might be in Bombay, another may be in Delhi. This guy starts scratching his nose, you suddenly find that guy also doing the same thing. It is common. We do not, we have not understood that. That is exactly what happens at, at the electronic level, where there is something called 
entanglement. They, there are two particles which are entangled with each other. Uh, I won't want to go into too much detail, but that's one thing. The other thing is superposition. Now we are used to a world in which you can either be zero or one. That's the basic principle used in computer programming. You either zero or one. When you enter quantum mechanics, you could be zero or one or both simultaneously. So you could be either zero or one. That's one state, or the other state is or both. So for each qubit, you have a two states. Supposing you are using two qubits, you'll have two raised to two states possible. So if you could use ten states, ten qubits, you got one thousand and twenty-four, which is in in classical computers you'll have ten states. In a quantum computer, you'll have one thousand twenty-four states. That means hundred times faster. Just imagine if there are say fifty thousand qubits used. Apparently, there are problems which which will take two million years to solve, which can be solved if you use a quantum computer with hundred qubits in ten minutes. That's where it's taking us to. That's why I said exponential growth. There's another concept you should understand that's quantum supremacy. That is that. This quantum uh, science and computer science is very nice to sit and talk here. You know, it's extremely difficult to program a electron, and to make a stable com uh, computer is not easy. So a lot of people who believe that this is not going to happen in the next 15 years. IBM says quantum supremacy is going to happen in four years' time. Quantum supremacy means we actually made a quantum computer whose speed has exceeded the speed of a quantum of a classical computer. So that's going to be a landmark year when. Quantum computers have proved to be more useful than a classical computer. It will take some more years to actually manufacture large systems, but at least you have made the science possible. Google and Microsoft have entered and are investing. The moment companies which are very commercially minded like these two enter, it means that there is something happening. In fact, just two months ago, Google announced that their first Quantum chip will cross quantum supremacy in 2017, not four years away from, like IBM is saying. 2017, they they are using a 49 qubit chip. So amazing things are happening. You think any of you here is less amazing than the guys in Google or anywhere else? It says that we have to get together and start doing some preliminary research. In this campus, so because because of that, there will be huge things happening in medicine, material science, structural engineering, and so on and so forth. If you don't have that, you are somewhere else. And uh, conventional C plus plus and Java and programming all that won't work on this. So there is a feeling that it will be quite tough to have practical applications in the next few years. And there is another school of thought which says, why very worried about Uh, programming at uh, electron level, where a slight shake will change the behavior completely. Slight as a vibration. So the quantum computers which are produced today have got almost zero degrees Kelvin temperature and vacuum. It's all under that, so that there's no disturbance. That disturbance causes something called quantum incoherence. You just can't understand why it is behaving this way. So they say, why not work on molecular compute computers before that? So lots of things happening in that field, but in any case, computer science is not going to be what it was till yesterday, in the next few years, and maybe we should get start thinking about that. So, what I want to want to tell you today is not to make you excited about all the new things that are happening, but for you to understand that it is possible to say which of this is going to happen in the next five years, next ten years, by actually connecting dots which are already visible here today. To the impact on something else, which will have impact something else. You saw how the oil industry is going to have oil at twelve dollars. Financial Express or Financial Times doesn't talk about it. They'll talk about it three years from now, but you can you can figure it out now. Now, like for instance, this gentleman here, he did something amazing in July. He's a Finnish professor. Uh, forget the name of the university. He has produced. Protein. It was reported in the Times of India yesterday, but I read the paper in July. He's produced pr protein 
the newspaper said from thin air, okay. It's not thin air. In air, whether it's in desert or here, there are microbes. Now, if you use captured air and carbon dioxide and using solar energy, he is able to convert this into protein, edible protein, small quantities. But it's, it's proved that it's possible to produce and it will be used for cattle feed and for addition additives. They are already doing, eating it as part of the meal, mixing it because it's got 48 percent protein. That's soya bean, soya bean is 46 percent protein. It's produced, it's expensive. But just wait for developments in that area and see what will change. It, the whole project is aimed at a very large objective. The large objective being we want to remove hunger from the world. I mean that's the vision. Like IIT has got vision to do certain things to change the face of this country. But we have to think of big projects like this where we will probably have to have virtual departments which can expand contract. There will be somebody from computer science, somebody from uh, physics, somebody from uh, electrical, all working together on some mega project. If you look at what can each department do, we will look at mini projects and we will feel happy. But we won't make a big impact and I believe the founders of this of IIT system imagine that we are going to have a huge impact. So I think the options are there. We have to go there. So whether you want to do uh, blockchains or solar or this or that, lots of exciting opportunities are there. It's only for you to decide I want to do it I, or you can decide my career is going to be in a company which does this or that and not some con something conventional because many conventional things are going to disappear. Okay. On that happy note, I am happy to answer questions.